Good morning, friends. As everyone's still filtering in, um, it's um, wonderful to see you all here. And it is a blessing, of course, to have everyone with us today on a wet and wonderful day to worship our Lord. Um, it seems like every time someone needs to come in or someone needs to leave, the rain starts again. So we'll be um, praying for a little break on that as we get out of here at the end of worship today. But meanwhile, we have a wonderful um, time of worship coming up. Um, we do have um, a bit of a surprise um, Pastor Warren had to um, go out of town unexpectedly, um, so we have with us today, um, filling in for him and ably so, um, our district superintendent Scott Oakey um, will be leading our worship today, so that is a blessing for sure. And I um, want to say hi to all the people out there in the um, Facebook Live land, I'm glad you're tuning in. And um, we will be just um, so you know, and in case I forget to tell you, um, we will be cutting off after our um, after the message. There'll be a song, and then we will be cutting off our live stream after that um, before we do joys and concerns. So, um, but we are glad you're here, and we hope you enjoy our worship time together. Um, if you're visiting with us, please take a second and um, fill out a yellow card um, in front of you in the pew rack, and um, please drop that in the plate as it goes by. Um, we will be um, not calling on you. We won't be coming to see you. We won't be calling you on the phone. We will acknowledge your um, presence and thank you for coming by way of a letter. Um, just would like to know and get to know you a little better. And as I say, more important than any paperwork you can do um, while you're in here, please take a moment after church, after worship, and join us in the fellowship hall. That's right through those doors and out to the left. And um, have a cup of coffee, a snack, and just um, let us get to know you a little better. We, we're just so blessed that you're here with us. Um, I only have a couple of announcements I want to highlight in your bulletin today. Um, the first page has a couple of hopes on the go. Um, one is October 19th. That will be out at Salem United Methodist Church on the east side. Um, we will be continuing our work out at Salem. Um, the other is October 26th, and that's out at Camp Widewater. So two very um, worthy causes for you to invest some time in. There are sign-up sheets out in the fellowship hall over that drinking fountain. Um, I also want to mention very briefly, um, because I know you will read it in your bulletin, um, the lay servant training weekend that's coming up on November 15th and 16th. Um, it is out at Camp Widewater. This is a great opportunity for you to um, um, just learn a little bit more of what it means to be a lay servant. and. Um, how to serve this church, um, this community, and this world um, as, a, as laity. And um, there are a number of different um, tracks you can get on as far as becoming certified. And um, I would love to take some time to talk to you about that. Um, if you're interested, you can um, track me down anytime. I'm here most of the time. So, um, and I will be here certainly after church today. Um, that's all I have to bother you with for the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Angela if she will come up with her announcement. Yes, good morning. My name is Angela Scherter. I am the Director of Children and Youth Discipleship here at HOPE. And this Saturday is our Zufari event. There's a half-page sheet in there. Um, please come out sometime between 1 and 3. It's a kind of an open house event. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of different activities, um, all centered around learning about how God is wild about you. So please come out, bring your kids, bring your grandkids, bring everyone in your neighborhood. It's just going to be um, a lot of fun. And if you're interested in helping, we still need more help for setup and things. Um, and we'll be here meeting that day, this Saturday on, at 10 a.m. if you'd like to come and join us. If you have any questions, talk to me after church. Thanks. All right, good morning, friends. We ask you to stand at this time and lift your voices with us as we praise our Lord, getting our souls on fire. Two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I'm 
running for your heart, I'm running for your heart, till I am a soul on fire, Lord, I'm longing for the race, I'm waiting for the day, when I am a soul on Sometimes we don't feel on fire, though, right? I'm going to pull Pastor Warren. It's just me, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know, God calls each and every one of us. We talked last week about how he uses imperfect people, and Jesus called imperfect people to join his side and to spread his ministry. And the thing that I have to remind myself of sometimes is um, I just need to respond to the call because I'm forgiven. I can't carry with me all the weight of the things that I wish I hadn't done. Um, I'm forgiven. And that's powerful. And that's what our next song is all about. One, two, three, four. I'm the one who held the nail. It was cold between my fingertips I'm hidden in the garden I've denied you with my very lips God, I fall down to my knees With a hammer in my hand You look at me Arms open for
laid under I could have been lost forever Yea, I should be in that fire But now there's fire inside of me Here I am a dead man walking No grace gonna hold God's people All the way please. God of heaven and earth, we long to be truly free. In this hour of worship, help us to grasp the freedom that comes from seeing you more clearly, loving you more dearly, and following you more nearly. Day by day, give us strength and courage to be your people in this time, in this place. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 35 through 46. This is the message interpretation. The next day, John was back at his post with two disciples who were watching. He looked up, saw Jesus walking nearby, and said, Here he is, God's Passover lamb. The two disciples heard him and went after Jesus. Jesus looked over his shoulder and said to them, What are you after? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, Where are you staying? He replied, Come along and see for yourself. They came, saw where he was living, and ended up staying with him for the day. It was late afternoon when this happened. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John's witness and followed Jesus. The first thing he did after finding where Jesus lived was find his own brother, Simon, telling him, we found the Messiah, that is Christ. He immediately led him to Jesus. Jesus took one look up and said, you're John's son, Simon. From now on, your name is Cephas, or Peter, which means rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. When he got there, he ran across Philip and said, Come, follow me. Philip's hometown was Bethsaida, the same as Andrew and Peter. Philip went and found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote of in the law, the one preached by the prophets. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathanael said, Nazareth, you've got to be kidding. But Philip said, Come, see for yourself. Well, good morning. It is um, a deep pleasure to be with you today and always a privilege to share the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, with, with congregations. I uh, met for, with Warren uh, last week for breakfast, and he uh, sadly told me about um, his friend who had died and left a beautiful wife and uh, at least one child. And so we talked about it and <clears throat> I said, are you gonna go? And he said, oh no, I said, I think they need you. And uh, he agreed. And so he's been in ministry with, uh, with a friend's family down in Louisiana and understand he's on his way back uh, today. Uh, long trip, please pray for him. He's lost someone significant in his life and uh, has made a long journey to, um, uh, to be with them with that family. So, uh, so pray for him. And um, I'd like to invite you to, to pray together uh, right now. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together would be pleasing to you. 
because you are our rock and our redeemer. In the great name of Christ, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I've been, I've been thinking, um, what would life be like without this guy named Peter? You know, this, this guy who speaks first, inserts foot in mouth, and, and thinks about it later. Or, or this walk on water guy who was a terrible fisherman. Or this chicken-hearted, scared of roosters, brave and courageous disciple. This great preacher in the church. He preaches one sermon. 3,000 people come into the life of the church. I wonder what the world would be like without Peter. And I wonder, too, what the world would be like without this guy named Nathaniel. And, and he, he's this guy, when I, when I read about him, I think the guy's depressed. And, and then, like, six seconds later, he's exuberant and excited about everything, and I can't figure him out. And, he, and he's one of these, the, these guys who, who is always unbelieving. He takes nothing at face value, but he becomes this this great follower of Jesus and, and starts sharing Jesus with, with other people. And I'm kind of an introvert and I look at Nathaniel and he's an introvert and he's doing all this great stuff for the kingdom and I can't quite figure out how he does all of this. But where in the world would we be without a Nathaniel? And, and when we think about it, without a person named Andrew, there would probably be no Peter. And without a person by the name of Philip, there would probably be no Nathaniel that did anything for us to follow. Albert McMacken was a farmer, lived back in the mid-1930s, and he had recently given his life to Jesus Christ, and his life was transformed in an incredible way. In about that same time, it was announced that the famous preacher and evangelist and revivalist by the name of Mordecai Ham would be coming to his little town to do revival services. And so Albert McMacken decided he was going to get as many people as possible to come and hear Mordecai Ham preach about Jesus Christ. And he did that, and many people said yes to his invitation, but there was one young man who was invited and just kept saying, no, I'm not coming. You see, he was much more interested in, in farming and in baseball and girls than he was in Jesus. Can you imagine that? And, and yet, Albert McMacken kept inviting him, and this young man kept saying no. Well, by this time, Albert McMacken had so many people going to, to this revival that he didn't know how to transport them there. And so he decides he's going to use his big farm truck and load all these people in and take them to the revival. But he didn't have a driver. And so he decides he's going to go back to this young man and he's going to say, will you at least drive the farm truck? And the young man said, all right, I'll drive the truck, but I'm not going in. So he gets in the truck, he takes all these people, stops at the place where they would enter for the, for the revival to hear Mordecai Ham. And he starts to pull away. And he feels this tug on his heart. And the tug on his heart won't make, allow him to make the accelerator on the truck work. And he sits there for a while. And he parks the truck. And he decides that he has to go in. And he enters this, this revival place. And he sits there and he listens to Mordecai Ham preach about Jesus Christ. And when the invitation is given, he walks down the center aisle, he kneels at the altar, and he gives his life to Jesus. And his life is radically transformed. Now you might know that young man. His name was Billy Graham. And I have to wonder, what would life be like without Billy Graham. That backwoods world traveler, that shy but outgoing preacher, 
that humble but exuberant person, that prayer, that preacher, that president helper, that CEO of a major corporation, where would the world be without Billy Graham? And where would the world be without a humble farmer named Albert McMacken? Now, I know that in, in, in many ways, at some point in, in your life, somebody invited you to come and be in this place. And that person or those persons, whoever they were, they were your Phillips. They were your Alberts. They were your Andrews. And because of them, your world is different. And friends, what was true 2,000 years ago? And 80 years ago, and 5 or 10 years ago, is still true today. People come to Jesus because of people. People come to Jesus because of people. And people recognize who Jesus is and what they can do for them. And they want to pass that on. They want to share it with other people so that they can know him as well. Now we can bring people to church at any time. And that's always really special. But let me tell you, and I know some of you are doing that, but let me tell you, there's probably about three or four times as many people out there today as there are in here today. And, and most statistics today say that most of our communities, if they're cities, if they're suburbs, if they're, they're towns and, and rural or urban settings, are 80 to 90% unchurched. So friends, the, the, the fields are, are white for harvest. And I have this thought, and maybe it's crazy, but what if each one of us brought one? What if each one of us brought one? I mean, think about what that could look like. Think what it would look like for families, for moms, for dads, for kids. What hope, I mean, what peace, what, what love, what joy could come to these families? And who could come? Who would come? Well, who knows? Someone might be asking, what would my life be without someone like you? What would my life be like without someone like you? So one of the questions that we probably need to answer today is why do we invite people to begin with? Well, I believe that we invite people based on who we believe Jesus is. I believe we invite people based on who we believe Jesus is. Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. Now the word Messiah means prince. It means chosen. It means anointed. He believed that Jesus was the anointed prince from God, the chosen one. The one whom Israel had been praying for for hundreds of years that would come to defeat their enemies, to turn their nation, their family around so that it could be forgiven, that it could be the, the family of God that God always wanted it to be. And that God would come again to rule over them. And they had waited for hundreds of years. And because Andrew believed that with all of his heart that Jesus was the Messiah, he wanted his brother to meet Jesus. Now, how many of you in, the, in this room have a brother? How many of you have a younger brother? Younger brothers are hard, aren't they? I have a younger brother. They don't always do what you tell them to do. They don't always go where you tell them to go. But Andrew believed in Jesus so much that when he talked to his brother Simon or Peter, it worked. Now listen to what it says. The first thing he did after finding where Jesus lived was to find his brother Simon or Peter telling him, we've found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he immediately led him to Jesus. I remember a, a, a bunch of years ago, my dad taking me to, to meet Joe Nuxall. 
Now, I, I don't know how many of you know who Joe Knoxall is, uh, but he was a famous pitcher for the uh, Cincinnati Reds. By the way, they still have a team uh, down there. And um, uh, he was also the youngest person to ever play Major League Baseball, pitched his first game when he was 15 years old. Can you imagine that? He was hugely successful. He was well regarded, hugely respected. And after retiring from playing the game, he would, he would travel to, to little towns and, and villages and, and county seat places where he would share his story and would encourage other young people about how they could, they could be, live a life that was, that was a great life. And my dad respected Joe Nuxall so much that he, he wanted me to be in his presence. He, he wanted me to hear him when he came to our town. And so we went there, I heard him speak, I got to shake his hand, I, I got his um, uh, autograph, I don't know where it is, but I got his autograph somewhere. Um, and, it, and I can remember that as if it was yesterday. I also remember a very cold January day when my dad took me to Cleveland Stadium to watch the great Jimmy Brown play football. You see, my dad believed that Jimmy Brown was the greatest running back to ever play the game. And he wanted me to one day be able to say that I saw him in person. And uh, did I mention it was a really cold day? And so I, I did, and I'm like 10 years old, and so I did see Jimmy Brown uh, through about 15 blankets that they had wrapped around me and, and covered everything except for my eyes to be there. But I'll never forget uh, being in that place. When the president came to our hometown, my dad made sure that I was there. He also made sure that I met his best friend in business, a man who had great integrity, and huge success, a man who my dad loved and admired. And he believed in all of those people enough that he wanted to take time and make sure that I got to meet them as well. You see, friends, we invite people to meet people who can make a difference in their lives. Let me say that again. We invite people to meet people who can make a difference in their lives. And so how we believe in Jesus determines how often or if we even introduce anyone to him. So, so if I could, let me, let me give you a little quiz this morning. You don't have to write anything down. There's not going to be any grade. I'm not going to know how you, how you um, uh, scored on this quiz. But let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus is the creator of the universe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that, that he went to the cross for you, he died on that cross, and was in the grave for three days? Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and has given us the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that whatever is impossible with us is always possible with God? that God loves you and everybody unconditionally no matter what we've done or what we've left undone? Do you believe that he has a plan for your life, a plan not to harm you, but a plan to benefit you and to prosper you? Do you believe that he will never leave you or forsake you? And friends, if you can answer yes to, to those questions, I'm gonna ask you this. Who else can better help your friend? Who else could better help your, your grandson or your granddaughter or, or any family member or any friend? Who else can do this besides Jesus? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me. And so if we really believe those things, then we're going to invite people because we're going to believe we can't fail. Now that doesn't mean that everybody we invite isn't going to be like your younger brother. There's going to be some people that, that aren't going to come. But let me tell you this. Your invitation plants a seed. And even though they might not want it, God never gets up, gives up. God continues to nurture that seed that you have planted. And I believe that one day that seed will sprout 
and God will have a greater harvest because of the job that you did. So we invite people based on who we believe Jesus is. And we also invite people because of how much we value others. I mean, don't we care for who we value? I mean, we, we care for the sick. We, we think about those people that we pray for in, in the worship service. We inquire about our neighbors that we don't see for a few weeks. We, we, we value and we protect those people that we, we care about. So we, so we get health and life insurance for people that we care about. We, we love and cherish and are faithful to those that we value. And the greatest value that we can ever add to anybody else is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, who values them more than Jesus? Who can enhance their lives more than Jesus? Because without him, life is incomplete and temporary, and with him, life is full and eternal. And don't we want that for others? And when we invite, we are saying that that person is valuable. Now, I get it that everybody isn't going to believe us. I get it that everybody isn't going to follow us where, wherever we go because there's people out there that, that think, oh, oh my gosh, if I came in here, that, you know, that ceiling would not be there. It would be landing on my head. And there are people who, who believe that the church is boring and judgmental and irrelevant. And friends, I've been to some of those churches, but not this one. People believe that but they get something different in this place. Now, when you think about it, they don't know what they're going to get. But you know what they're going to get. Andrew knew what Peter was going to get. Philip knew what Nathaniel was going to get. Albert McMacken knew what Billy Graham was going to get. And they might not be sure, but you and I are sure about what they are going to get. I love the parable about a man who who visited a church for the first time. Pulls in the parking lot, parks his car, starts to get out, and another call, pull, car pulls up and it says, hey, that's my parking spot. You took my place. And the man was taken back about it a, a little bit, but he didn't say anything. He enters the, into the, the church and he finds a Sunday school classroom. He takes a seat. A few minutes later, somebody else stands in front of him and says, hey, that's where I sit. You took my place. Again, he was taken back, but he didn't say anything. And then after Sunday school, he made his way up to the sanctuary. He found a, he found a place, and sure enough, a couple of minutes later, somebody's standing there and said, hey, that's my place. You took my place. And the, the man was greatly troubled, but again, he did not say anything. But when the congregation was praying for Christ to dwell amongst them, the visitors stood and his appearance began to change. Horrible scars became visible on his hands and his feet and on his brow. And someone from the congregation noticed what was going on and cried out, what happened to you? And the visitor, Jesus, said, I took your place. I took your place. And I believe when your friends come here that they're going to see how Jesus wants to take their place. Now, friends, we need to be clear that the purpose of all of this is it is, it's not a numbers game. It's not about giving, getting more people in the life of the church, even though that's important. This is all about people's souls. This is all about people's hearts. Maxie Dunham, who has been a, a, a pretty well-known name in, in Methodism for a lot of years, uh, once described our denomination like this. He said, we're a denomination of many issues, 
controversial issues. There are strong feelings about abortion, homosexuality, war, immigration, and more. He said the truth is there is only one issue. Bringing people to Jesus. When John Wesley commissioned Thomas Koch to be the first bishop in Methodism to come to America, he stood on the docks of England with him and uttered one request, offer them Christ. Offer them Christ. And so the purpose of our inviting is to offer people a relationship with Jesus Christ who can change their hearts. The surgeon sat beside a boy's bed. The boy's parents sat across from him. Tomorrow morning, the surgeon said, I'll open up your heart. The boy said, you'll find Jesus there. The surgeon was annoyed And he said, I'll cut open your heart to see how much damage has been done. And the boy said, you'll find Jesus there. And the surgeon said, when I open up your heart, then I'm going to see how much damage there is, and then I'm going to sew you back up and see if I can do anything to help you. And the boy said, but you'll find Jesus there. All the Bible stories say it. All the songs we sing are about how he lives there. You'll find him in my heart. The surgeon had enough. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to find. I'm going to find damaged muscle. I'm going to find low blood supply. I'm going to find weakened vessels. And I'm going to find out if I can help you. You'll find Jesus there too. He lives there, said the boy. And the surgeon got up and left. After the surgery, the surgeon sat in his office recording his notes. Damaged aorta. Damaged pulmonary vein. Widespread muscle degeneration. No hope for transplant. No hope for cure. Therapy, painkillers, in bed rest. Prognosis, he paused. Death within a year. There was much more to record, much more to say, but he cried out, why? Why have you done this? Why have you put him here? You you put him in this pain. You, You caused him this early death. Why? And the Lord answered, This boy, my lamb, was not destined to be a part of your flock for long. For he is part of my flock and will forever be. In my flock, he will feel no pain. He will be comforted as nobody can imagine. And his parents will one day join him and they will know my peace and my joy as nobody else could ever know it. And my flock will continue to grow. The surgeon's tears were hot. His anger was hotter. He said, you created that boy. You created that heart. And he'll be dead in months. Why? And the Lord answered, This boy, my lamb, shall return to my flock, for he has done his duty. And I did not put my lamb with your flock to lose him, but to retrieve another lost lamb. And the surgeon wept. Hours later, the surgeon sat beside the boy's bed, the boy's parents across from him. The boy awoke from surgery and whispered, did you cut open my heart, doctor? Yes, said the surgeon. And the boy said, and what did you find? And the surgeon said, I am so sorry. 
I found much damage. And the boy with a smile on his face said, did you find anything else? And the surgeon nodded and he said, I found Jesus. And friends, I believe that when you invite your friends here, they will find Jesus and their hearts will be changed. Well, this morning is World Communion Sunday. People from all across the the globe are, are celebrating God's purpose in going to that cross. His body broken, his blood shed. And in a few minutes, we're going to invite you to come and and to receive that that sacrament, the the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. But I want to challenge you that, that as you come, that you would be thinking about neighbors and friends and maybe even family members who need Jesus, who, who need to be in the fellowship of the church. And, and maybe as you come and, and you receive communion, maybe you name those persons in, in your mind before Christ. And then when you go home today, you, you write down their names. Put that piece of paper in a place that, that you see it every morning and you can pray for them. And when the Holy Spirit says it's time, you invite. Think of the difference that that could make in those people's lives. Friends, I'm convinced that the the Holy Spirit wants to work through each of us to reach these people. They are valuable to him. They are valuable to us. And only he can save. And so I say to you, come to Holy Communion. Come you Andrews. Come you Phillips, come you Alberts, come you Dave and Sally's, you Bills and Anna. For one day, people might be saying about you, what would my life be without you? Amen. Friends, God put a million doors for his love to walk through. Just remember that one of those doors is you.
walk through one of those doors is you. I said, God put a million, million doors in the world for his love to walk through. One of those doors is you. come to um, that point in our service where we are going to um, say goodbye to our friends on the live stream. Thank you for joining us. We do hope you'll be back with us again next week as well. Um, we are going